My name is Dan Malott. I am a principal for West Monroe. Uh, we are a business and technology consulting firm based in Chicago in the United States. Uh, and this is the session Secure SQL Server Design Tactics and Technology. Uh, I'll be in the comments uh, during, the, uh, during the presentation to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and uh, as always, any time in between sessions, uh, catch me in one of the one of the rooms that the conference is providing, uh, and we can chat about things then. Also, towards the end of the session, I'll share my contact information uh, where you can reach out to me uh, that way as well. And so with that, let's jump into the session. So as I mentioned, this is SQL Server Design, Secure SQL Server Design, Tactics and Technology. So quick note, uh, before we get too far into our, uh, into our session today, uh, this is really meant to be a high level survey of the tactics and technologies available for securing SQL Server and the data within it. Uh, if you're looking for a more in-depth treatment of the topics, uh, this might not be the session for you. Um, taking a look at some of the other sessions, I noticed there's a deep dive into uh, database encryption, for example. Uh, if you're looking for something deeper, that may be, may be for you. Uh, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'll start out with a brief introduction. Uh, we'll talk about securing database objects. So this is, this is more on the tactics side, right? We're just going to, how can we design our databases to uh, help us with security. Uh, along with that, uh, what's my role? Uh, so role-based authentication. Then we'll survey SQL Server built-in features, how and when to use them. And uh, at, towards the end, we'll talk about when you can't start fresh, right? Because we don't always have the ability to design our databases from scratch and uh, you know put all the best practices into place all at the start. So why are we here? Okay, so 95% of all breach records were in government, retail, and technology in 20, the year 2016. Um, so we're all technologists, so this kind of applies to us. The following stat's a little scarier. 95% of data breaches are due to human error. So that is something I, you, your coworkers did wrong or missed or forgot or stuff happens, right? Uh, the average cost of a data breach uh, is expected to exceed uh, 150 million US dollars in 2020. That's quite a lot of money. Um, I expect this number will actually end up being higher for this year due to uh, COVID complications and the rise in uh, activity that we're seeing um, from malicious actors. 3.8 million records stolen every day and there's a hacker attack every 39 seconds. Uh, one of the things my firm does is incident response for uh, when a company gets ransomware or, or things like that. And I can tell you that we have seen quite the uptick in activity. So what kind of data do we actually need to secure, right? Because the easy answer is all of it, but we need to classify our data so that we know um, what is needed and what's not. So uh, personally identifiable information, my name, my birth date, uh, my address, um, financial information that I have, like my bank account. Um, protected health information, uh, in the United States we call that HIPAA data, um, but that's really any information about our health, the care that's been given to us, any conditions that we might have, uh, data governed by GDPR. Um, this is not something that's just uh, applicable in the European Union. Uh, across the world, we all have to think about this. Uh, payment data, so credit card numbers or ACH information. Uh, these are really important uh, pieces of data to secure. You don't want uh, something like what happened to Target in the United States a couple of years ago, where uh, all of a sudden everybody's credit card numbers were getting dumped out uh, from their terminals, right? We want to secure that, or ideally not even like hold it ourselves. Uh, data that might affect a company's stock price or public standing. So, uh, you know, we don't want to allow dirty laundry or 
or good news to get out uh, before it's publicly available, right? Uh, it, in the United States, we have the SEC. They don't look kindly on this sort of thing. Uh, industry trade secrets, salary data, um, you know, these are things that are just considered sensitive and that you probably want to secure. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how can we design our database to help us with this. Uh, and so tables, views, store procedures, um, these are all the basic building blocks of our databases and we can use them to help us. So how do we access, how do we limit access to sensitive data? Um, tables, uh, we can split tables to hold sensitive data in a side table that's more secure. So you might have uh, your basic human resources data and then the, uh, you know, sensitive human resources data, salary, birth date, that sort of thing. Um, there are some drawbacks here. Um, we can use this. We can use schemas to separate. Um, this, this generally requires a little bit more, um, a little bit more programming, a little bit more thoughtfulness. Um, access to tables can be secured individually. We'll talk about that far more uh, in the future. Uh, likewise, we can use views to hide sensitive data in the underlying tables. Expose only the columns that you want. You can apply masks to them. Um, views are selectable and filterable. They're just like tables, right? Uh, just keep in mind that uh, you know whatever the SQL that you wrote to define the view gets executed every time. So there may be performance implications. All right, so let's take a look at an example. So we see here an example of splitting tables. And so uh, I'm using the uh, Wide World Importers database as the underlying database for this, uh, but we're doing some sort of custom things. So here I have a table without sensitive info. So ID, first name, last name, and a higher date, right? These are all things that are fine. Uh, and then I have my table with sensitive info. Uh, so I have the same ID. I've defined it as a foreign key that references my primary key over here. Social security number, so that's important in the United States. Uh, other countries have other like public services numbers, right? Uh, salary and birth date. Um, so these are, these are things that you wouldn't necessarily want publicly available. And then to make sure this is a one-to-one -one relationship, create a unique clustered index on our ID column on the table of sensitive info. You can go ahead and run this because we'll need it later. And you can see that ran successfully and we're good to go. So next. Uh, so we can do this all in the DBO schema and that works out fine but you probably don't want to do that long term because it creates a bit of a management nightmare. Um, we can use schemas to separate different uh, classifications of data, different domains of data, and we can use them as security objects. So in this case, we're going to create the same two tables, but we're going to create a couple of schemas to help us out. So in the first, we're going to create a non-secure data schema and create our same first table there and a secure data schema. You'll notice that these table structures are exactly the same. And then I'm going to insert some data into these uh, for, uh, for use later. And successful, 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 great. Okay, so now writing queries to handle both of these things every time is going to be kind of a pain. So this is where views can come in really handy. So we'll come back over here using a view. So I'm going to create a view called human resources employee view. So this would be used by my human resources users. Um, so some really important things here uh, from a security perspective, but also from a database management perspective. Uh, schema binding, um, this is something that you should probably use on all your views, but this will prevent someone from changing our underlying tables without also modifying this view. 
uh, view metadata so that if we're hooking this up to Power BI or something like that, that automatically senses uh, the metadata, we'll get metadata as though this was a table. And then with encryption is really interesting because it secures the system tables from being able to report what the underlying definition is so that uh, someone who has access to the database will have a harder time of finding out what is the definition of this view if we haven't given them the view definition on it. And so the view itself, pretty simple. Um, we're going to select all of our information. I'm applying a mask on the social security number. Uh, the non-secure data joined to the secure data on the ID. And so as before, this is a one-to-one -one relationship. We're going to get one one row from each table, and we're going to get only the information that we want to share. Going to create a human resources user. Um, without login is a really useful thing for testing security uh, because it doesn't require you to create a full login on the database or server level. Uh, we're just creating a user in, in the database that we can use temporarily. Going to give it select. Going to execute as that. And, execute, and try to select from our uh, secured table. And then you know, we'll see what happens with that. So we'll go ahead and run this block. And you can see, OK. And they, the uh, results come in a little strange order because we're using uh, notebooks here in Azure Data Studio. Um, but OK, so all, everything completed successfully. Select permission denied on object employee database SQL with schema secure data. Okay, so at this block, I couldn't get to it. But when I selected from my view, huh, I, I was I was able to I was able to see everything that I needed from the view, and my social security number came through masked. Um, so this is a way that we can split tables and use views to um, to help us out with securing data. So next, this is still kind of a pain. Um, store procedures can help us out a lot. Um, using store procedures and restricting access to only store procedures is, this is the easiest basic way to handle security. Uh, it also has some nice performance implications because you don't have to worry about um, ad hoc queries or anything that, that's not so good there. Store procedures will return only the data they need to return. Um, you can use business, apply business logic, sanitize inputs, um, make sure you're not having SQL injection. Um, you're disallowing direct access to your tables. Um, so, you know, you can't just select from here and be clever about your where clause or anything like that. Um, this is going to potentially have an impact on your application developers if they're not used to this already. Um, couple of notes there. Uh, most ORMs have the facility to use store procedures for data access. Um, if the one you're using doesn't, I suggest Dapper. It's an excellent micro ORM that plays really well with stored procedure data access. Um, I'd say it's probably the preferred one, preferred way to do it there. We'll jump back over to our notebook. And uh, so really similar codes to what we did in the view. Um, just no parameters for right now, just returning our two tables joined together. Uh, Going to reuse my human resources user and grant execute. Um, and I will go ahead and, we'll go ahead and execute this. And then I'm going to try to select from the non-secure data just to show that we're, it's, you know, that table is also accessible. So we'll go ahead and run this. Yep, got that same idea. Select permission was denied, so that's good. And you can see the stored procedure return the same data set as the view. Useful. All right. Now, there's a concept here that we've kind of been touching around um, that can help us out as well, and that we should really seek to um, seek to to put into place in all of our um, databases, all of our servers, everywhere. And that's the idea of role-based access admin, role-based access. So how do we manage security for all these objects, right? Because we're potentially introducing a lot of objects, but even if you're thinking about securing uh, just 
you, access to tables, um, there's a lot of objects to handle individually the way we were doing it before, where you have a lot of grant statements, right? So roles allow you to logically group permissions at the database or server level. Um, there's some you're already familiar with. DB owner, it's the thing that all the developers want in your dev environment. Uh, they probably want it in the other environments too, uh, but they can't have it. Um, data reader, data writer, um, somebody at some point along the line in your organization probably created a DB executor role as well. Uh, that's not the DBA that um, says no, that's the, uh, you know, that's to execute stored procedures. Uh, Sysadmin, security admin, server admin, these are, you know, the server level uh, roles. So they're all predefined, um, which is great. Uh, quick and dirty situation in a test environment, uh, you know, we have an application that's behaving badly. People think it's a data issue. Let me just throw you DB data, right? D data reader, right? Look at the data to your heart's content. But should we be satisfied with the built-in roles? Absolutely not. They're very broad-based. Um, they're meant to be quick and dirty, and they're really not suitable for any environment where you need more detailed permissions. Uh, so we can define our own roles that group permissions logically, right? And then we mix permissions to give each role only the permissions it needs, right? So the principle of least privilege. Um, this is a best practice. Um, only give people the rights to see what they are allowed to see. I do a lot of consulting in um, the healthcare space. And one of the things that the, the HIPAA regulation stipulates is that you should only have access to data that you need to do your job. Uh, you shouldn't just be able to go look up everybody's uh, claims history, for example. And then from here, we assign users to roles based on their membership. Um, we can integrate with what our sysadmins have already done uh, and use Active Directory groups to roles. Um, this works out really well. Um, and then when we need to revoke access, we simply remove the user from the role or the user from Active Directory. And uh, that, that's it. They can no longer have access. Uh, so let's take a look at how we actually implement this. And just so everybody's aware, the uh, SQL uh, is in the presentation, which I believe will be uploaded, as well as in the scripts, which I'll also seek to make available, uh, either through the conference site or on, on my blog. So implementing role-based security. Uh, so we, we're talking about a human resources user up above, right? That user that we created. So let's create a role for human resources users. Now, when we think about what they should have access to, okay, they should be able to execute our stored procedure. Great. If I'm in human resources, I can see the non-secure data. If I'm in human resources, I can see the secure data as well because I need that to do my job, right? I need to know what your salary is. I need to know what your birth date is. Um, but I'm gonna deny select, you can, deny select on a single column. So I'm gonna deny that you're able to see the unmasked social security number um, as a human resource user, that you wouldn't need to uh, wouldn't need to see this. I'm gonna create a second user uh, so that we can you know, test this out. Get add them to our new role. And then we're gonna test some, uh, some selections. So execute the stored procedure, see our non-secure data, see our secure data and see only the columns we're allowed to see from our secure data. Let's go ahead and run this. Okay. So again, the order is a little weird here, um, but our one row, one row, select denied in one row, roughly corresponds to one row, one row, select denied, and one row. Okay, so we can see the results, great. Why did this one fail? Well, if you remember up above, I denied select on the SSN column. Now, the what this does is it says, well, you can select whatever you want from this table except this column. And when I do a select star, star is a stand-in for all columns, right? So those of you who have something like Redgate SQL prompt, you can expand it to all the column names, right? This is a tremendously useful feature. 
But because I've essentially said, give me all of the columns, when SQL Server goes to execute the query, it says, well, but you don't have access to the social security number column. So I'm not gonna let you run this query at all. Um, so you can see, this is a great place where uh, the role-based access can be really helpful. All right. So that's uh, sort of an overview of uh, some of the tactics that we can use. Uh, Role-based security in particular is a much, much deeper concept. Um, and uh, we can talk about uh, how you handle uh, scenarios where you have a much more complex database. Um, how do you deploy this out over multiple environments? Uh, how do you manage this? Um, you know, feel free to uh, throw me a question uh, in the in the uh, in the chat, and we can we can kind of try to answer some of those questions as we go along. Feel free to ask any other questions about anything that we've just talked about as well. Uh, you know, this this is a um, these these are these are tactics that can be incredibly useful, um, but you know there's also some some nuance there. All right, so SQL Server also has a ton of built-in features that can help us out here, um, and so we're going to look at these. Some of them are also not that helpful. We'll talk about that as well. Okay, so the built-in features that we have: uh, always encrypted, row-level security dynamic data masking, transparent data encryption, and SQL Server audit. We're gonna go through each of these. I'm gonna demonstrate some of them and, and not others. Uh, always encrypted is our first up. Uh, so what is it? Uh, always encrypted is a feature that allows you to control encryption inside client applications and never share the keys with the database engine. Um, so anyone reading a column encrypted with always encrypted will only see an encrypted binary string. Uh, so why would you want to use this? Um, essentially, you can protect sensitive data by removing the ability to read it at all from the database, right? Because the database doesn't have the keys to be able to decrypt the column. So it's just going to send you back a, a binary string. Um, what are the drawbacks? Not all clients support always encrypted. Um, you know, if you're in the .NET stack and you're doing a SQL Server, like you're probably going to be fine. Uh, if you are working outside of that, your mileage may vary. Um, if you encrypt via randomized, um, so the, there's there's two ways to to encrypt the data. There's there's randomized and uh, essentially repeatable. That's not the term, but you you either randomize where the data looks the same every time, or you randomize, or you either encrypt it where it looks the same every time, or you encrypt it where it gives you a random result. If you use the random result, you cannot use that column for joins or any operation requiring an equality operator. Um, and so this this can have a huge performance impact. Um, obviously, you, you know you can design your way around it. You can push a lot of your processing to your client applications, um, but you're going to lose a lot of the ability to do uh, really nice set-based things. Um, this one's kind of obvious. Encrypted columns cannot be updated using the database engine directly uh, because the database engine doesn't know the key. So uh, it's not even going to allow you the option to update the column uh, except via an external um, query. And then the columns themselves have to use a different collation than you're probably running. They have to use one of the bin two collations. Um, and this is due to the nature of the binary data that's stored in them. Uh, so I don't have a demo for this because this is incredibly complicated to set up and not really suited for a uh, 50 minute session. Um, but happy to talk about talk more about um, where I think this could be used uh, you know, in the chat. All right, next, row-level security. Um, so row-level security allows you to use group membership or execution context to restrict access to uh, data rows in a table using a table valued function applied as a where clause to the query, um, with the added bonus of this happening transparently to consumers. Uh, that transparently has some caveats. Um, so why would you want to use this? Um, 
it's transparent. It helps to centralize security logic, uh, particularly if you have a situation where there are multiple consumers or you're dealing with a multi-tenant database. Um, so like if you have web application and Power BI both accessing, uh, then you're gonna want to think about using something like this because then you don't have to implement the security in both places. You're only implementing it in the database engine itself. Uh, there's broad, love, broad compatibility with uh, most SQL Server features, which is important as well. Um, some drawbacks. Uh, there might be a performance hit depending on the logic of the table valued function. Uh, so that is, you know, you have to be careful when you're writing that. I know a lot of a lot of us are wary of using functions in your database because of the performance implications. Uh, partition views are not supported. Kind of makes sense. Um, you and this then it, it's kind of a weird one as well. You cannot create an index on a view on top of a table with low-level security policy in force. Um, and so the reason for that is that the view doesn't inherit the table value function necessarily. And so you, you, when you create an index, it just creates a situation where uh, SQL Server can't apply the security properly. And then lastly, um, for anyone who is using uh, temporal tables, um, which I, it's a feature I really like. Um, I think that there's still some work to do with it, but it's, it, we've used it in a couple of projects and it's been really successful. Um, these do not automatically inherit the security policies of their parents. So if you're just inherit, if you're just implementing your temporal tables using the default setup, um, your history table isn't going to have the role level security policy on it. Um, and so that's something to think about. I would argue that you probably want to be uh, designing and being deliberate with your history tables anyway so you would remember that you need to put this in place okay so how do we enable row level security pop back over here and we're going to walk through it okay so first uh create a schema to store our security objects this is a sort of a general best practice anyway uh we'll create our function this is reusable, so you can reuse this function across many tables. So in this case, uh, rule of security, my schema, orders customer ID predicate. All right, and I'm gonna take a user ID. Um, returns table, using schema binding, this helps with um, additional permissions on security objects. And then my table value function is just return one as the predicate where my session context user ID is the user ID that was passed in. Um, and so then we may also want to filter by login if you've got multiple logins or applications. Um, I generally like session context. This is something that can be set externally. Um, and in this case, if it isn't set, um, you're just not going to get anything. So that's, that's great. And then we create or apply our security policy on our table. Okay, so this is, we're creating a security policy for on our orders, uh, orders table. Orders customer ID is the name of the policy. So I'm adding two predicates. So the first is a filter predicate. Um, and so customer ID is the column from sales.order that I'm going to pass into this function that I just created. And this adds the uh, table value function as a filter when I uh, run any query against the table. And then I'm going to add one other item here, which is a block predicate. Same, same definition on sales.org after insert. Uh, and so the reason why I'm doing this is because otherwise, I might be able to change the customer ID on the row to be able to see rows that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And so in this way, oh, sorry. That's not what after insert does. After insert prevents me from uh, inserting customer rows that don't belong to, or inserting orders that don't belong to me as a customer. So I can't like order a MacBook on somebody else's customer. And then I might go ahead and turn them on. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. 
success, 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 great. Um, and then we'll run a quick test here. Uh, so we'll do, again, using our uh, without login guy, going to give select update delete insert on sales.orders, um, create user without login. Um, we're going to deny, and so this is what I was mentioning above. We could, could do this with a block predicate, but better to handle it with denies. So we're going to deny update on the column that we're filtering on. Um, just so that we can't all of a sudden change orders between customers. Um, obviously, you might have a role where that was allowed, but also properly uh, uh, properly audited. Go ahead and execute as our temporary user. We're going to do use a set session context. So the session context is additional data that is sent with the query um, that SQL Server can use during the execution of the query. So in this case, I'm adding, and it's, it's key value. So I'm adding the key user ID and the value four. We get all of number four's data. And then I can change to number five, get all of number five's data, and then undo what we just did. So go ahead and run this. And you can see number four has 107 rows. You can see all these guys. And number five has 121 rows. And you can see all the ones that we got here. Um, and so this is row level security. Um, it's really useful. Next up, dynamic data masking. Now, and this is one uh, that's been talked about in uh, on the SQL Twitter recently. So uh, we'll help address some of that. Um, so dynamic data masking applies a masking function to data when it is read by non-privileged users. Um, like row level security, this is totally transparent to your users, aside from they don't get data that they thought they would get. Um, so why would you use it? Uh, rather than relying on application level filters, uh, dynamic data masking allows you to specify a mask for data that applies to all queries. You think back to what we did with our view definition earlier, we're essentially doing that, only we don't have to define a view. Again, broad compatibility with other SQL Server features. And you can specify your own masking functions or use the default. Uh, drawbacks, columns encrypted using always encrypted cannot also have a mask applied to them. Makes sense. Uh, you cannot apply a mask to a computed column unless one of the underlying columns is also masked. Uh, again, kind of makes sense. And then, uh, and this is the one that's been making the rounds recently that I've seen, it may still be possible to derive the underlying data by applying a clever or not so clever where clause. Uh, and I'll kind of talk about that as we go into the, uh, into the, um, the demo here. So dynamic data masking. Okay, so we're going to go back to our uh, uh, idea of sensitive data for an employee. Dynamic data masking ID, first name, I'm going to mask with a function partial and then six X's. Uh, and so this is going to uh, give me, well, we'll see what it gives me. Last name, anybody can see it. Email, there's a building function email. And then phone, we're going to look at what the default does. I'm going to insert one, uh, one row of data. This is my email, this is my phone at my work. And then we're going to go ahead and select it. And I will uh, go ahead and we're going to see how you can get um, get some data by being clever. All right, successfully, successfully, successfully. OK, so the first one, I am obviously a privileged user. So I can see everything, right? Uh, I'm running under. Uh, SA, as you can see up at the top. So I can see everything. Great. I see the row exactly as I inserted it. All right, my test user, just regular select, no unmasked permission at the server level. Okay, D plus six X's. Great. You can see my last name a lot. This is what the email function gives me. So even if I had entered .org, it would still come out with .com. And then default with the phone just gives me the four X's. Now,
our last one, where phone like three and wildcard, still gave me the row. And so this is where using dynamic data masking, um, you have to be really careful and really considerate about what you're doing. So it is possible using a clever query to determine what someone makes salary wise, for example. So if you have, um, if you have someone who makes uh, 50,000 US dollars, for example, um, I could write a query where um, it equals 50,000. And that query is still going to run and still going to filter and still going to give me all the rows of the people who make $50,000. Um, and so this is, uh, this is just something you need to be aware of. We are not preventing the discovery of the data with this uh, particular feature. Uh, we're simply uh, making it a bit more challenging to get at. Um, if you really don't want someone to uh, to get at the data in the column, use always encrypted or use uh, uh, deny deny select on the column. You know, don't don't uh, don't rely on dynamic data masking. All right, moving on. We're almost there. Uh, transparent data encryption. So this is the practice of encrypting the database, sorry, the data in a database while is it, it is at rest. This includes backup files taken using SQL Server's built-in backup functionality. Um, so great, right? Your backups are now encrypted. Why do you want to use it? Uh, so there's an additional level of security for your data at rest, making it more resistant to being compromised if someone, you know, uh, goes into the Azure uh, data center, figures out which of the uh, which of the big cargo containers has your database. And, okay, sure. The storage device is stolen. Now your your data is less uh, likely to be compromised. Um, the important thing there, though, is now you're extending the encryption to your backups as well. So if you're storing your backups in something like Azure Blob Storage or uh, Amazon AWS S3 or something like that, uh, you know those are those have less rigorous security, but you know you you're helping with that security as well, as long as you don't lead, lose the key. So drawbacks: uh, the server OS probably already covers this, um, whether it be a BitLocker or some other method. Um, the ability to read the data is entirely dependent on your certificate, your key. Ex backups as well. So if you lose the certificate, your backups are now unreadable, which is bad. That could be a resume generating event. Um, TDE does integrate with a bunch of key management providers, including Azure Key Management, um, but there is risk there. And then last, and depending on your uh, particular use cases, this might be a big issue. Instant file initialization is not available when using TDE. Um, and that's, this is another one of those where if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because um, the database actually has to encrypt the new uh, blocks that you're allocating. Um, I would suggest if you want to use TDE, you should be using planned database file growths. Um, that is not a possibility for all of us. So just be aware. Again, this is one that's really easy to set up. So we'll walk through the demo. Uh, so a couple of these are gonna fail because I've already done this on this particular Docker container that I'm using, um, but all of these steps are needed. So uh, you create a master of for your database. Don't use password one, two, three, exclamation point, please. Uh, then we create a certificate. Uh, please, please, please back it up or use key management. And then we apply it to our database. So we create a database encryption key, use AES-256. If something stronger comes out, please use that. Uh, encryption by our certificate. And then that would fail. So we'll go ahead and fix it. All right, let's do it. So like I said, a couple of these are gonna fail. That's okay. This is also gonna take a minute. Yeah. Um, so, right. Uh, my top two failed because they already existed, um, but then uh, the rest of it succeeded successfully. Uh, and 
SQL Server did us a solid here. Warning, the certificate used for encrypting the database encryption key has not been backed up. You should immediately back up the certificate and the private key if the certificate ever becomes unavailable or if you must restore and attach the database on another server, you have to have backups to both the certificate and the private key or you can't open it. So thanks SQL Server, uh, we'll try to do that. Okay, one last item here. SQL Server Audit. And again, this is one that is a huge, uh, huge topic. So we're going to give a brief overview here. Uh, this allows you to log events and the details about those events when they happen on the server level or the database level. Uh, permission changes, object access, uh, specific user or group of users access data on a specific table. Um, so really audit all the things. Um, why I use it? Provides a built-in way to log events and ensure security policies are followed um, while ensuring traceability in the event of an external audit. Uh, it can also help detect malicious attacks. Um, so for example, a high number of failed logins, probably a malicious attack. Um, drawbacks? Uh, anyone with sysadmin can alter the auditing or turn it off entirely. Um, so hopefully you trust the people who have sysadmin. Uh, events are logged to the Windows event log or a file, both of which can be difficult to access easily. Um, we have a, a piece of software that we use for, um, for uh, threat hunting that the Windows event log is one of the crankiest pieces of it. And uh, lastly, by itself, uh, SQL Server Audit doesn't perform any active alerting. Uh, so this is... Um, you know, that, that case of detecting an attack against a server, you have to actually write something to monitor that. Um, again, this is a huge, huge topic. I don't have a demo for it, um, but, you know, we can talk a little bit more about it um, after the session. Okay, so these are all great things, but what do I do for my uh, databases that are already in existence, right? Okay. Things you can do today, and by today I mean Monday and potentially not even Monday because you are going to want to talk to other people in your organization before you put some of these in place. Okay, enable transparent data encryption. Yes, your OS probably handles this already, or your system administrator or your SAN administrator. And yes, it's just a checkbox in Azure. But do it for your backups if nothing else. All right, second, take an inventory of your users and their permissions if you don't have this already. If you're going to roll, go into a role-based system, this is a necessary first step because you have to design those roles. It's also going to have to track down the 50 people that have sysadmin that really probably shouldn't. Uh, also, the people that may have the that one login that everybody knows the password to that uh, everybody's been using for the last 10 years. Um, third, talk to your boss about conducting a security audit and what to do with the results. Uh, and this can be done internally if you have the bandwidth. Um, there are numerous organizations that can help you with this uh, externally as well. If you want some professional services, third party, some of that's gonna come down to politics. Uh, I find a lot in my line of work that people believe the consultants, even though the people internally have been saying the same thing for years. Um, fourth, talk to your security and compliance people. Find out what they're already doing, but also ask them how they think you can help. Um, so when I was a DBA, um, I had a really great working relationship with our uh, security uh, and compliance officer because I would essentially go to him and go like, okay, well, what do you need? Tell me what you need, Let me, and then let's have a conversation about how we can get there. And then lastly, talk to your application developers about how they consume data. Probably an ORM, it probably keeps you up at night. Entity framework, something like that. But this can help you understand what object changes you can make without affecting application functionality and which will require code changes. Um, your application developers might be unaware of some of these features as well. Um, and so they can you know, start putting some of them in place. And then you can start planning deeper changes. Um, so, Engage with your IT team, start planning role-based access, uh, data access changes, 
schema-based data grouping, right? That could be a pretty large refactoring of your database, which is scary. Um, audit strategies, when we're going to use dynamic data masking or role level security. Uh, some projects, totally transparent, uh, switching to views, right? You can, you can do this, like if you have a good, like couple hours of an outage window, you can do this and nobody's, nobody's gonna be any bit wiser, but make sure your entire team's on board. And as always, please make sure you have a solid test plan in place. Uh, don't just make changes in production because these can be resume generating events. All right, as I've mentioned a few times, I'm available for questions, uh, both right now and uh, throughout the conference. Uh, just hit me up. I'm more than happy to have a conversation about this or about software development um, or about uh, the best place to, uh, to get some good food in Chicago if you're over there. So uh, please, please let me know. And uh, as promised, my contact information, um, Hit me on Twitter, blog, GitHub, LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter is probably the best place to reach out to me. Um, decently active there with uh, SQL Server things. Uh, it has been my pleasure to uh, talk with you all today. Um, I hope that you are enjoying the conference. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And I hope that I get to see you in person at some point uh, once we've gotten past all of this COVID. Uh, one last item before I sign off. I have some more reading at the end of the deck. Uh, so this is documents for uh, all of the uh, technologies that we, we covered today. Um, the links here are for the 2017 versions, uh, but you can easily link over to the 2019 versions instead. All right, thank you all very much. I appreciate your time today, and I hope that you are all uh, healthy, happy, and uh, have a good, enjoyable conference.